Hello and welcome to another X-Force Data Summit presentation. Today we have Steve Baines, who's the CEO and founder of Forcivity, a consultancy in Manchester, New Hampshire. And Steve's going to tell us about uh, some essential soft skills to become an exceptional architect. So here's Steve. I am Steve. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you know, this is playing in the, the morning in the Eastern time zone, but you know, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. It's actually a few folks in uh, Australia who uh, might be listening to this. So I know it's the middle of the night. So have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee like myself and, uh, you know, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so this is uh, essential soft skills to become an exceptional, an exceptional architect. Uh, for those of you that know me, um, they know, you know that I spend a lot of time talking about soft skills. Uh, you know, hard skills are something that Salesforce has really done a great job of giving us materials and mechanisms to learn that and you know, take those exams and become very skilled up from a hard skill perspective. But what really makes people exceptional architects is the ability to deal with the more human side of projects and those soft skills that you don't necessarily teach you in school and it's something that maybe you just have to uh, you know, learn through experience. So this talk today will be about those soft skills. Uh, so quick introduction about myself. Uh, I am the CEO of Forcivity. We're a Salesforce uh, system integration partner and ISV partner. We're based in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is just north of Boston. Um, this is where I always joke that New Hampshire actually is part of the United States. It's not part of Canada, for those of you who don't know where it is. But of course, our claim to fame is the presidential primary. We also have a city that has the only triangle-shaped manholes in the whole country. So a little fun fact about New Hampshire. Uh, I'm a certified technical architect. I became a Salesforce CTA in September of 2018. I took my CTA review board in Atlanta. Uh, I got my first cert Salesforce certification in 2014, but I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem since 2004, first as a customer and then as a partner. Uh, so I always tell people that I've been uh, on Salesforce since version four of the API and uh, we're on version 49, I think right now. So that is definitely showing my age. Uh, I'm the co-organizer of Northeast Dreaming, which is a Salesforce uh, user conference, which I'm sure you've heard of many dreaming events uh, throughout the world now. Uh, used to be just a few in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, many of them are being postponed because of the situation we're in right now. But um, you know, very proud to be part of that team. We've had two events so far, and we're looking forward to our next one. Uh, I am the host of CTA Office Hours. That's a monthly uh, event that I put on. It's very similar to going to office hours at school or your college professor. It's an opportunity for you to uh, just chat with the CTA, and I have other CTAs join me from time to time. And it's really just an open dialogue to have folks um, pose interesting questions or challenges, and we all try to help them solve those. And sometimes it's just a discussion about uh, Salesforce things in general. So if this was an in-person event, what I would be doing right now is I would be polling the audience to ask them uh, who would consider themselves to be an architect. And this is where I typically get just a few uh, amount of hands put up in the air. Uh, and then I'll ask yourself, you know, do you consider yourself to be an admin uh, or are you a developer or an admin or a builder? Like really just kind of get a sense of where you think you are and what you would refer to yourself as. Uh, the reason I ask that is because uh, our perception of ourselves as architect, I think, is much different than a lot of us think. And my hope is that this presentation kind of takes you through that journey to realize that we actually are all architects. We may not just have it in our, our title. So first things first, uh, this is my favorite architect. Uh, and for those of you who may or may not get the reference, um, this is George Costanza, and he was a major uh, character in the uh, sitcom series Seinfeld. And the running joke throughout the 10 years that the show was on is that whenever George would meet somebody, typically a woman, he, and they asked, she asked what he did, he had always joked that he was an architect. Uh, of course, it was a bit of a joke, and he was trying to make himself seem a little bit more important, uh, in this case to women, so he could, you know, they'd go on a date with him. But um, I simply show this as a joke, but also to kind of talk a little bit about this whole notion of architects being this elevated kind of mystical uh, position a bit. Um, so for those of you who have not actually seen George in action, here he is. If I see her, what do I say that I'm doing here in the building? Oh, you came to see me. I work in the building. What do you do? I'm an architect. Oh. I'm an architect. Have you designed any buildings in New York? 
Have you seen the uh, new addition to the Guggenheim? You did that? Yep, yep. It didn't take very long, either. What about architects, Stephen? He's into architecture. Hey, just like you pretend to be. Let me be the architect. I can do it. I can do it. Look, why couldn't you make me an architect? You know I always wanted to pretend that I was an architect. I'm, uh, I'm an architect. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what are you designing? Uh, railroads. Uh, I thought engineers do that. They can. You. Very knowledgeable. I'm, uh, I'm also an architect. You're an architect? I'm not. I, I can discuss other things, you know. Uh, architecture. <laughs> that thing is higher than architect. I suppose you could be an architect. Well, isn't an architect just an art school dropout with a tilting desk and a big ruler? <laughs> it's called a T-square. <laughs> okay, so you can see that uh, there were many scenes with him referring to himself as an architect. So it was a 10-year running joke in Seinfeld. Um, obviously, I put this in as a joke, but also to kind of reinforce the fact that there is a little bit of a mystique around the title of being an architect. Uh, and my goal really today is to, is to remove that, that Kind of mystical aspect of an architect and really help you all come to the realization that we are all architects and we we do architectural work every single day uh, we just may not be called architects so let's flip over to the architect journey itself i'm sure many of you have seen this triangle before uh, you know you've got the the newest salesforce plushy route there who was introduced last year at trailhead dx but this is the architect pyramid uh, each of those areas are what are referred to as uh, you know, domain certifications or domain expertise. Uh, of course, you know that the application architect is much more builder focused or configurator focused, uh, declaratively focused, whereas a system architect is much more technical focused. Now, the thing that I'll always point out to folks when I'm ever giving this talk is that you don't necessarily have to be a developer to be an architect. And I would, I would actually say that you don't have to be a developer to be an architect. This is one of the common mis misconceptions about being a, a CTA or just an architect in general is that you have to have really, really strong coding chops. Uh, it's not necessarily that you need to be a super strong coder, but it's more about you just have to have an understanding of what the possibilities are with Salesforce technologies when it comes to coded solutions versus declarative solutions. That is the whole notion about being an architect is really having a good understanding of what the possibilities are. It's like, you, know, you don't necessarily have to know how to do every single thing in the Salesforce ecosystem, but you just have to know that they're possible and that you can design a solution and then perhaps hand it off to a solution architect or a developer. Uh, I grew up as a developer. Um, I don't really write code that much anymore though, so I, but I still continue to function as an architect. And the reason I can do that is because I have an understanding of you know, code, you know, what, what's possible with code. It's not even about how to write a class or how to write a trigger. It's simply about, I know that things can be done with code, or I know that when customers are asking for certain requirements that can't be done declaratively, that I can go to a coded solution and do that. So if there's anything you hear me say consistently throughout this talk is that you do not have to be a developer in order to be an architect. Some of the things that you do have to think about though is that this is really about being business minded. It's thinking about how these solutions will satisfy your, your business users' requirements, you do have to have a level of te you know, uh, technically adept. So you still do have to understand what's possible on the Salesforce platform. But it's really about being that Jack and Jill of all trades. It's having that mastery at a, at a level that you can discuss solutions and different approaches and best practices and design that solution and then in turn hand it to somebody. And oftentimes you may be handing it yourself to do that work. Uh, this kind of goes back to the whole notion that we are all architects. We just function in different capacities depending on the size company we're in or the size team that we work on or project working on. A lot of architects are master of many things and sometimes they're just master of some things. You do not have to have super wide knowledge or super deep knowledge across everything related to Salesforce. You can be, a master architect in uh, e-commerce or marketing cloud 
or integration. You can specialize in architecture, and that's really the intent of this certification uh, pyramid is to you know, allow you to really focus on areas that matter most to you or matter most to your company or matter most to your team. You don't necessarily have to achieve every single certification on this pyramid. Again, you do not need to be a developer uh, to be an architect. I'll say that over and over again. When I chat with people about their journey to CTA, I'm, I'm chatting to a gentleman right now, and he was actually asking me if he should take a step back in his career and actually spend some time working as a developer for the next couple of years before he goes and gets a CTA. And it all goes back to that notion that you have to be a developer. And I actually said, you really don't need to do that. You can really drive towards being that CTA, still get a little coding experience, you know, learn your chops a little bit, but it's definitely not necessary to really deviate for a couple of years and become a super strong developer just to achieve uh, becoming a certified technical architect. All right, so let's talk about what architects proverbially do. So these are more hard skills. So this is what's referred to as the 5D approach. You may have heard this before. So when we are working on a project, the first thing we'll do is we'll do discovery. And we'll go out and say, hey, tell me a little bit about this problem. <clears throat> what are we trying to solve? What are your business requirements? And the stakeholders will tell you what they want. And they'll often say, you know, can you do this? And then we actually you know, define what we're going to do. This is where we tell the stakeholders what we think they need to do. Uh, now, us as architects, this is where we look at the solutions and say, my business users are asking me for this, or they've already come to me with a solution. Um, should we do that? Or should we do it a different way? Should we do it at all? You know, this is where we, you know, we put that business cap on and really start thinking about this from a business perspective. Is this really the best solution? or are there are different ways we can go about this. Then we go into design mode, we're building. Be coding, might not be coding. Uh, I can get, share a most recent example uh, with you that I worked with one of our customers to develop a COVID solution for them. Uh, and it's been deployed at fairly large scale. Uh, there's not a single line of code that's been written in that solution. It was a 100% declarative solution. Uh, so yeah, again, kind of reinforces the fact that you don't have to be a developer to be an architect. You can really think about what's the best fit solution, time to market your budget, the users that you're working with, um, and just really what the requirements are. Of course, there's lots of things you can build with code, but sometimes code is just too much. You know, there really is elegance and simplicity. In this case, building everything uh, declaratively was the simplest approach, and it actually turned out to be the most effective approach. Now, as part of that 5D approach, of course, the fourth stage is developed, and again, not necessarily that you're, that you're developing. Development can mean a lot of different things, especially with tools like Flow right now, where you can build really powerful automated solutions without writing any code. And then last but not least, you go into deployment mode. And of course, there's lots of ways you can go about doing that. Um, this is definitely outside the scope of this talk, but you know, uh, continuous development and DevOps as a whole is a burgeoning industry in the Salesforce space. And there are many, many options available to you. But at the end of the day, the whole notion of getting your, your, your build from a pre-production environment into a production environment is typically your last step. So our solutions, you know, really what should they be? You know, we're supposed to, we are supposed to design and build robust solutions. And what that means is that it's something that's got to work. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be sturdy. It can't be a house of cards. It's got to be something that your, your customers can rely on. We also have to think about the concept of retry. It's really about, you have to design solutions for when things will go wrong. It's not about if things will go wrong, it's about when they'll go wrong. As an example, if you design an integration between an ERP system and Salesforce, eventually there's going to be a problem with that. You're gonna have bad data, there's gonna be a transmission error, maybe login credentials go bad, something will go wrong. How do you handle that? How do you design that into solutions so your users can retry that transaction or the code retry that transaction. Then of course our solutions have to be replicatable. It means we have to be able to do them over and over again. And again, it goes back to being robust and being reliable. Um, but you know, these still really all focus on hard skills. It's all about designing solutions. This is very, very technology focused. Let's talk about why we're really here. And this is about acting and thinking like an architect. 
Now you notice I wrote up at the top, I am an architect, but I put am an in parentheses. Reason I wrote it that way is word architect is actually a noun, but it also can be a verb. So an architect is a person who's responsible for inventing or realizing a particular idea or project. So when I say, hey, are you an architect? This is what we all immediately think of. It's like, oh, I'm not an architect, I'm a developer, I'm an admin. But when you use the phrase, I architect, totally different meaning now. Now we're talking about the verb. We design things and we make things. This is where we all can now start to bridge the gap of, hmm, maybe I actually am an architect because I'm designing little micro solutions or micro scenarios or micro services. There really is architecture. It doesn't necessarily have to be this grand scheme, grandiose type of design and solution that we're putting together. It really can be at a micro scale. So uh, other video here, this one is a quick, uh, quick video as well, but the backstory to this is years ago, I used to work in plumbing and heating wholesale. And there was a time when uh, I was the buyer for Kohler plumbing products. And this was happened to be a commercial that came out at the time. Um, so it kind of resonated with me because I, I found a really, really interesting way to weave it into the story about being an architect. So I'm going to go ahead and play it. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about it and um, you know, just kind of frame it in the way that Salesforce architects can kind of apply this to some of their real world experiences. This is a classical design we did in Milan. This is a postmodern residence in Milan. won five prestigious awards. Hockey headquarters in Kyoto. To see our architecture, you don't want to call them. You don't want to call them. So, what can I do for you? Design a house around this. All right, what was that? <laughs> you know, for, so for those of you who uh, maybe couldn't quite hear that, really what she did is they sat down at the desk and he's showing off all of these great things that he's designed uh, with his firm. And he says, what can I do for you? And she slams the faucet on the table and says, build a house around that. So what do we call that in, arch in the architecture world? You guessed it. That's requirements gathering right there. So that was her requirement build a house around this faucet. Believe it or not, I'm standing in the house right now that I tell people all the time that I actually built it around a pool table. Um, you know, way back uh, years ago when we were living in our old house, I really started to get into playing pool and I wanted to have a pool table. Same time we decided to build a house and um, I built my game room specifically around being able to house a certain size pool table. And it fits perfectly. We don't have to use little sticks or anything. Um, so that was really my version of the Kohler faucet. But, you know, it's like, it's like no, so sometimes do you really sit in front of users and be like, what? What are you talking about here? I mean, because really what, you're, what you have here is she's your stakeholder. And it's up to us as architects to really look at our stakeholders and be like, okay, I was just given a really vague requirement. How can I go about extracting the right level of detail from her to make sure that she's happy with what I designed for her. You know, and the kind of the way that she's looking at it, she's like, she's just kind of giving this look like, what do you think about that? How do you like them apples? And he's like, challenge accepted, I can do that. So this is where we now start talking about the art of being an architect. So let's get into it. Let's start talking about some of these soft skills. First and foremost, it's obvious. The skill of talking. For those of you that know me, you know that I have no problem talking. I can talk and talk and talk till the cows come home. But what's equally as important to talking is listening. Talking and listening together becomes what we all call communicating. <clears throat> but it's important to be able to know when to say yes and when to say no. Now, on the surface, it sounds like those would be really easy things to do. But the reality is, is sometimes they're really challenging. When you've got you know, a business user that's coming to you and says, no, I really, really want this, or this is how you're going to do this, sometimes it's really difficult to say no to them. It's like, how do you help them through that when you know it's not the right solution, or you know there's a different solution that will do it better or faster or cheaper, 
or just because you've got somebody else who's giving you a requirement that's completely contrary to what this user is saying. So this is where it becomes less about science, less about hard skills, and more about the art of being an architect. So let's talk about the art of listening. There's a hyperlink on this slide here, which I highly encourage people to check out. I reference it quite a bit, and it talks about the principles of listening. Listening is a skill. Listening is very different than hearing. Um, and I, you know, part of becoming an architect, and for those of you who are thinking about going for the CTA review board, one of the skills that's emphasized uh, immensely as part of preparing for that is your ability to communicate, not only to verbally communicate, but also to listen. Um, that's really one of the things that they'll look for. And this is just like being in front of a customer and being able to convey to them your solution that you've come up with. So what's the first thing you have to do in order to listen? Goes without saying, you have to stop talking. Uh, of course, if you're talking and the other person's not going to talk or you're truly not listening there, so you've got to stop talking. You've got to prepare yourself to listen. Now, what do I mean by that? It's simply not looking at somebody and be like, all right, go ahead and talk. I'm listening. It's a frame of mind. Uh, it's relaxing your body. It's really opening your ears and opening your mind to what they're saying and being ready to receive it and absorb it and being able to react thoughtfully to what they're saying to you. Do things to put your speaker at ease. Uh, oftentimes when we're in there and we're, we're, we're dealing with customers and we're gathering requirements, sometimes there's a little, you know, uh, they're a little uh, bit uncomfortable with it because they're not quite sure what this project is. Why are you asking me these questions? Why are you asking me about my job and how I do things? Like, are you getting rid of me? Am I getting fired? Uh, are you automating me out of a job? They're wondering all these things. So do things to put them at ease. Remove distractions. This is something I insist on with my team. If you are in with a customer, the one thing you should not have anywhere in sight is your cell phone. Turn it upside down so you can't see it. Put it in your pocket, remove the distraction. Because when you become distracted with other things, you are telling that customer that they are less important to whatever just occurred. Uh, and I, I have been in meetings with a CEO of a company uh, with my boss, and I've literally been mid-sentence about making a $250,000 investment in an ERP package, and his, uh, his Southwest app dinged to him while I was talking, and he literally got up and went over to check because he thought he was going to get a good fare from Southwest Airlines. Huge distraction, really changed my opinion and how I viewed him, and it was very dis I felt it was very disrespectful because it told me that you know, him getting $50 off, off of his Southwest Airlines airfare was much more important to him than everything that I had worked so hard on. So remove those distractions and really make your user feel like they're the most important person in the world right now. Empathize with them. You know, understand that technology solutions have a huge human aspect to it. It's not just about sitting down and configuring Salesforce. There are people behind those screens, behind those keyboards that are making things happen. And when we make technology changes, you are impacting people's lives. Some people react very emotionally to technology change, and we have to be sensitive to that. Be patient with them. Uh, sometimes users may not understand what you're talking about. They may not understand the application or the landscape as well as you do. So really be patient with them and let them verbalize themselves. Take it in. Try not to react negatively and really absorb what they're saying to you and help them work it out. Help them communicate with you. Help them talk to you. Uh, avoid personal prejudice for sure. So be open-minded. So don't walk in there with preconceived notions when you're listening to somebody. Um, allow, allow their opinion to seep in and consider it without bias and really <clears throat> use that information objectively when you're coming up with a solution. Listen to their tone. Listen to how they're actually talking to you. You know, do they have, you know, a bit of a attitude in their voice or are they getting quiet? You know, that really can, you know, help you understand what's truly occurring with this particular customer. You know, why are they acting that way? Are they acting angry? You know, is there, is there a bit of an attitude? Or is there like, hey, you know, I'm smarter than you. Uh, you know, so it's really important to kind of pick up on that tone. And I also will say body language to really understand what they're actually feeling. Don't just listen to their words. Listen for ideas. Listen to what they're actually saying. Again, this is the whole idea of truly listening and letting it come in. You'd be amazed at the gems that you're going to get out of uh, talking to business users. Forget about talking to executives and directors and just kind of saying, go forth and do this. 
It's more about when you start talking to those line of business users, the people who are actually doing the work. It's amazing the, the gems of information that you'll get from them. And of course, the nonverbal communication is key. Um, <clears throat> I always joke that I received probably my biggest dose of nonverbal communication when I had a customer actually throw a clipboard at me, believe it or not. He literally hung, flung a clipboard at me. Uh, it certainly wasn't verbal communication, but it was physical communication for sure. Uh, it turns out that it had nothing to do with me, um, but if, you know, I joke that it was really, you know, you've got to really pay attention to the subtleties and sometimes people may shift with their bodies. Uh, yeah, you know, even right now with the, with everybody being in, you know, COVID quarantine, you know, doing things over video conferences now is you, you lose that sense of communication and it's really a challenge for sure. It's like, how do you maintain that and really get a, you get a sense of, you know, how people are feeling or do they shift in their chair? Are they rolling their eyes? Are they crossing their arms like this? You know, that's always a telltale sign that there's not too jazzed what's going on. So I actually have re you know, retitled this whole slide and I really call it the art of shutting up because that's really what it's about is just zipping it and listening, shutting up, stop talking. Uh, I always ask people, I'm like, are you really listening or are you just waiting for your turn to talk? So these are really the soft skills now that we have to think about. So it's not about waiting for somebody to stop and then you just immediately chime in because you are telling them like, oh, you know what? You really didn't listen. You didn't really hear what I just said to you. You were really just waiting to respond because first of all, your response was instantaneous. And second of all, your response really had nothing to do with what I just said to you. So you definitely want to convey the fact that you are truly listening. You're simply not just waiting for your turn to chime in. Knowing how to do something versus knowing what to do. Now, here's an example that I always use. Years ago, when I worked in the plumbing and heating industry, I was out at a job site, and it was two buildings that had to be connected by a bunch of pipes to run. The heating system was over here. There were some units over here, and they have to run cool and hot water under the ground. Well, the guys had reached the point where all of these lines weren't fitting in the conduit. Um, and the architect happened to come out and they basically got into an argument because the architect said, I designed this on paper and these should all fit in the pipe, no problem. And the guys, the field guys were like, don't fit. And here are all the reasons why it's not going to fit. And that really is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a subtle difference between being an architect and knowing what to do versus knowing how to do something. The architect knew that you had to get pipes from here to here through an underground conduit, a 10-inch round conduit, but he didn't really necessarily know all the tricks about how to do that and what happens if the pipes are crooked and they get stuck or they just don't fit. He doesn't have that type of knowledge. And that really is the subtle difference between being an architect and knowing what to do versus handing it off to somebody else and say, here, go execute my solution now. You do have to know how to talk. Communication is key. But what's as important to knowing how to talk knowing how to get people to talk to you. Being able to extract information out of users is really difficult. It can be a challenge. And sometimes people will clam up. Um, for those of you who have seen Office Space with the two bobs, you know, you know that when you're getting visited by the two bobs, you're not going to say anything. You're just going to sit there and answer with one word uh, answers. Uh, business users may get the same way. They may have, you know, they may really be questioning your motives. Of like, why are you doing this? Again, go back to next explorer. It's like, are you automating me out of a job or why are you changing this? It's, it's, we've always done it this way. It works great this way. You want to make sure that you tailor your message to your audience. Don't treat everybody the same way. You know, really kind of hone your message, hone your approach, hone your words, hone your attitude, everything to who it is that you're talking to. Some folks like really direct talk. Uh, other folks like, you know, kind of softer approach, you know, the softer side of being an architect for sure. So really understand your audience and understand their motivations and understand how you can get through to them and effectively communicate with them and in turn, get them to communicate with you. My favorite soft skill of all is begin with the end in mind. <clears throat> so for those of you who are Stephen Covey fans, you know that this is one of the seven habits. Um, I always start with the end in mind. Uh, I always ask, okay, what are we trying to achieve here? What are our objectives? What's important to you? Take it down to a micro scenario. It's like, what do you need on that report? What do you need to see for fields? And let me work backwards from that to make sure that I build the right object structure for you or I build the right workflow so the data will get in front of you. Start with the end of mind and then work backwards from there. It's amazing when you know what your result to be, how many different design decisions you make leading up to that point 
as opposed to starting at the beginning and working toward the end and then suddenly realizing that you don't necessarily have everything that you need in order to truly obtain you know, that objective that the user is looking for. Don't forget about the difference between can we do this versus should we do this. This is where being an architect is so essential. Users may say, I want you to do this and I want you to do it this way. Can you do that? And of course, 99 times out of 100 with Salesforce, the answer to that question is, yeah, we can do that. But as architects, we should say, should we do this? Or should we do it this way? Or should we do it that way? This is where us knowing what to do, knowing what's possible, really makes us exceptional architects. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to know how to write that code or know how to integrate with that system. But we know that, yes, an integration is needed or some automation will be needed to do that. That right there is an essential skill for an architect. Be sure to recognize obstacles and roadblocks for sure. So I said earlier, technology has become so easy that we really spend very little time working on technology. It's more about everything leading up to that. It's the people and process. So if we remember back to this person, right? It's like, is she a roadblock? Is she an obstacle? Or is she somebody that's gonna help you? You know, and it's really now, okay, it's like, not all architects are like, not everybody's jovial like, like, like work. So <laughs> this is where we have to really get creative with everybody there is in them, because even we may get architects that, you know, may not have expertise in certain areas. So, it's up to us as business users to be able to provide the resources to our users to say, you know what, I'm not sure about that, but let me go find out. Let me go find the answers for you. All right, so let's talk about the typical project. Now, if I took a pie chart and I divided the project up into multiple pieces here, I would say today, because technology has become so easy, we only spend roughly 10% of our time with actual fingers on keyboard touching the technology. The other 20% is working on process, how to do things, changing how to do things. How do we get data from here to there? We spend the vast majority of our time working with people. At the end of the day, we are working on people projects. We're not working on technology projects. Uh, I'll give you a great example. My physician retired last year. He retired because his hospital was implementing a new EMR system. He wanted nothing to do with it. He had gone through it 10 years ago. He said, you know what? I am not doing that anymore. I have no interest in changing my world, my technology world. You're going to tell me notes differently, how to triage my patients differently. I'm not doing that. So he literally retired because of a technology project. He was a fantastic physician. He was a great loss to the hospital. You know, I miss having him as my doctor. But as you can see, at the end of the day, this is really becomes about people. It's not about technology. We really are human behaviorists here. At the end of the day, that's really what we're focused on is how do I help this person through this change? How do I help this group or this company through this change? It's really not about how do I make Salesforce do this? A lot of us can do that. Many people can do that, but it's more about how do I get these users to adopt what's just been built? Uh, even though they've been very verbal with me that they don't like it, because they have to change how they do things, or now they spend half of their day doing extra work, or they have to come in earlier or at different times because things are done differently now. So what do we actually do? Now, I hear a lot of verbs here about what architects actually do. Here's what we do. You could say like, well, you write code, you create data diagrams, you create fields. That's not what we do. We guess. We have to sit there and guess. It's like, okay, what do they mean by that? Or sometimes you just have to extract information. You just don't get clear information from your customers. It's like you got to yank it out of them. You've got to empathize with them. You've got to put yourself in their shoes. I've had business users become quite upset. I've had some cry because of changes that were happening because they were, you know, to an outsider, those changes felt very simple and very small. And the reality is, is that it was rocking their world. It was such a drastic change to their world. And it was extremely disruptive and it was very upsetting to them. We have to help our users envision uh, the end goal here. I mean, we have to evangelize the solutions that we're creating. We have to paint that picture. We have to say, okay, everybody, here's what we're doing. And here's why you should get excited about it. 
This has nothing to do with writing code. This has nothing to do with touching Salesforce. Again, it's about those softer skills. It's about getting folks on board with your vision and when you're, with your design. Uh, we have to enable them to be successful. So it's not just simply about like, here you go, here's the solution. It's about, here's the solution. Here's how you can be successful with it. Let me show you. Let me educate you on what's, what's happened here. Let me tell you why we've done what we've done. It's not simply about, here we did this, use this. We have to evaluate. We have to really make decisions. We have to evaluate multiple different variables, multiple different choices, and really come up with the best solution. When I went before the CTA review board, uh, one of the things that they told me when I was preparing is that when you present your solution to the judges, it's not about picking a right solution. It's about picking a solution and being able to stand behind it. I have, you have many choices that you can evaluate. There are many ways to do the same thing in Salesforce. So it's about evaluating all the variables that matter to you, you know, time, budget, skill sets, team size, all of those things to say, okay, this is the best solution for this scenario. <clears throat> Sometimes we have to coerce people. Sometimes we have to say, listen, this is gonna happen. Or we have to kind of force them down a road because there are other things and other decisions that have been made that maybe this person's not privy to or it's not part of the conversation, but you kind of have to force them a certain way. Sometimes you gotta put your arm around them and just counsel them through you know, and say, hey, listen, this is why we're doing it. And it's really just kind of starting to become their advocate and helping them through a situation. And you even have to console them sometimes and say, hey, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, there's a lot of good reasons why we're doing this. And, you know, me and my team are going to be right there with you through this, so it really will be okay. You've got to facilitate uh, conversations for sure because sometimes decisions are not all black and white. They're not straightforward. So you've got to play that facilitator. You know, you've got to play ringmaster. You've got to stand in front of the room and be like, okay, I hear you, um, but what about this? Or have you thought about it this way? you know, reframe that question back to them. Um, it certainly is an art for sure. Um, there are certainly trailheads out there as well that talk about a lot of these soft skills. Uh, but what we actually have to do is we have to defend. Sometimes we just have to defend our solution and say, this is what we're gonna do. This is what, how we're gonna go about it. Uh, it's almost like getting your, uh, your dissertation or your PhD for Salesforce is you've gotta put something out there and then you've gotta defend it. Um, you know, because so, not everybody's gonna believe in it. So you've got to have some reasons, you know, some facts as to why we're choosing this way. Again, it's not about doing it right or wrong. It's about, I've got eight different choices here. Which one is the best way to go about doing this? At the end of the day, I refer to this collectively as what's called being a corporate therapist, because that's really what we are. We're human behaviorists. We are really talking about dealing with people in process. It happens to be done in the context of a technology project, but we actually are corporate therapists. So I would ask you all now, you know, are you an architect? You know, would, you, would you now consider yourself to be an architect? Because architects, what they do is they develop ideas, they design projects, they make things, they design things. Like see, everybody is an architect now. We're all architects. You just didn't know it yet. So my hope is that this talk has helped you come to that realization that we all architect in every aspect of our jobs, every single day, we just may not be called an architect. There are some great resources out there on Trailhead about public speaking and storytelling, uh, some things that are really uh, core to who I am and how I operate. Um, my very first course in college uh, was a public speaking course. Uh, within the first five minutes, my professor said to the whole class that this will be the most important class that you take in your life. And he was 100% correct. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but looking back on <clears throat> everything that I learned in that class, it was immensely valuable. And I've carried those skills with, with me throughout my entire life. Uh, I would highly recommend that one trailhead right there. You can look for it specifically by that name. It'll pop right up. And of course, anything around storytelling and communication will certainly help you become or become an even better exceptional architect. And thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, I had a couple questions, maybe observations. I mean, I, I mean, you're, you, you're really emphasizing, you know, that you don't have to be a developer. I would even go another step further and say that uh, sometimes being a developer might trip you up in the Salesforce ecosystem, because if you're too eager to write code to fix a problem, you have to think twice. You have to, I think you have to think twice in the Salesforce platform before you decide you have to write code. 
You absolutely yeah. do. I mean, cause you're finding you can, of course you can solve most things with code, but yeah. coding is not always the best solution. Um, will it do exactly what you want it to do? Sure. But do they have staff to support it? Um, do you, are, do you, do you have the ability to test every single scenario? Do you have the time to write that? Um, you know, you know, like who's going to take care of this once you're gone. I mean, so there's, there's so many reasons that go into whether or not you should code or not code. Um, you know, do you have you know, all these testing requirements? Um, you know, so it's, it's easy to simply default to that and say, yeah, I'll just code this, get out of my way and code it. It may not be the best solution for your customers though. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, thank you very much. I think it was a great presentation. And I think that thank you. I, one of my questions is going to be, are there trailheads for those soft skills, but you outlined them. Yes. I think that's one of the great things about the Salesforce platform and their, and trailhead and, and the idea and trying to make a administrator, uh, this, the self the, that if you, if you want to learn those skills, you can in this platform. Absolutely. And anybody can do it. It doesn't matter what point of their career they're in. These are, these are skills that are applicable to everybody whether you're just starting out or you've been at it for 30 years. Great. Thanks again, Steve. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye.